Hi everyone and welcome to this IB Europe Industry Insider webinar with Meta. We're delighted to have you all joining us live today. My name is Marie-Claire Puffett, I'm a Marketing and Industry Programs Manager here at IB Europe. Um, and for those of you that, that perhaps don't know, Industry Insider is a webinar format that we host um, to provide real learnings and insights from industry leading companies across our membership. So we want to present the latest trends and best practices from across the industry. And so far, this has included topics such as brand safety with Group M, value chain transparency with Pubmatic, um, and more recently, European uh, Connected TV Insights with Magnite. Um, and recordings of all of those are available on the IAB Europe website if you wish to access them. Um, but today I'm very excited that we have Meta here with us uh, to discuss one of the hop hottest topics actually at the moment, which is e-commerce. Um, and indeed how to future-proof your business. Um, joining us today, we have our very own Chief Economist, Daniel Knapp, who will be providing an overview of the e-commerce landscape in Europe, revealing everything you need to know about this exciting channel. Um, and then he will be joined by Zara Chateau, who is Head of Connection Planning at uh, Meta, to provide a deep dive into how shopping behavior is changing and why creator commerce is a key trend uh, for 2022. So lots of lots of future looking there, which is great. So before I hand over to Daniel, just a quick bit of housekeeping. Um, as I mentioned, it is a live event. And so we do encourage you to share any questions that you may have for our speakers. Um, and you can send these via the Q&A box, which is at the bottom of your Zoom interface. Um, and we will also be recording uh, the session um, and it will be available for you to watch back and share afterwards. And so with that, I am going to hand over to Daniel. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you very much, Mary Claire, and hello, everybody. Um, of course, e-commerce um, is a topic top of everybody's minds, at least since 2020, but the landscape is moving incredibly fast. Um, in particular, when it comes to um, the launch of new services, M&A activity, and how businesses buy and sell side can really capitalize in, on, on consumer trends and provide the best possible e-commerce services. When Zara and I discussed this session today, we realized it's actually a good fit uh, regarding our joint perspectives. Um, I will speak more about market structure and overall economic dynamics, and then Zara is going to join and provide um, a, more of a meta consumer angle. So um, each of us has about a 15 minute presentation and um, I'm gonna just dive right in to help us understand the emerging commerce advertising landscape. What kind of signals are we seeing in the markets? How will they translate into long-term trends? And what is the overall outlook for the sector? And um, when I speak about the sector, the key question of course also is who's really part of that sector? And I think that's one of the really exciting things where we see a lot of new market participants um, entering the advertising value chain that haven't really been there before. Um, we just started at RIB Europe to um, update our overall digital ad spend outlook. And to do that, I actually traveled back in time before the pandemic to understand what did we predict in terms of digital advertising market performance before this rapid digital transformation induced by the pandemic really happened. And this was the picture. We saw a slight slowdown of growth gradually to mid single digits by the end of 2026. This is all from a base market of around 63 billion euros in 2019. This picture has changed considerably. Our latest forecast looks at this. So we saw indeed a blip in digital advertising or a slowdown of 6.3%, but it was less than anticipated. So the market held up quite well in 2020, driven by changes in, in consumption, online streaming, but also fundamentally e-commerce and the requirement of businesses to um, drive customers to their store, move from a brick and mortar to an online business model and so forth. This trend is persisting in 2021, where we're expecting a nearly 30% year on year growth for digital advertising. But the really remarkable story here is that um, after this downward correction in 2020 and the upward correction in 2021, we are not seeing a 
regression back to our initial 2019 assumptions. However, we are seeing a continued faster growth of digital advertising as many of the trends we have been seeing are not cyclical developments, but structural changes in how consumers deal with media, but also how they buy things online and in the brick and mortar in the hybrid world. So overall, this means that the pandemic was a long-term net positive for the digital advertising market. If we look at the e-commerce landscape, um, we are seeing something equally remarkable. Um, many of you will recall that I showed this chart when we did um, our first e-commerce update at the around mid 2020. And we moved in the UK, and this is exemplary for other markets as well, from a fairly linear growth patterns, um, just with some you know, inter-year spikes for certain months, from a linear growth pattern in e-commerce um, e sales to an exponential growth pattern. The key question always was, if the, when the economy opens up, when brick and mortar stores become available again to walk into and purchase goods and services, um, what will happen to e-commerce? And indeed, if you look at the far right bit of this chart, we can see a downward correction when it comes to internet sales as a percentage of total retail sales. However, this shouldn't surprise us because um, the economy had opened up again, meaning that there is now more competition, of course, between e-commerce and brick and mortar. But overall, despite the economy having opened up, if you look at the blue line here, we can still see in an open economy, e-commerce being at a considerably higher level as where it would have been had we not had these digital transformation changes uh, due to the pandemic. Also, it's notable that despite a downward correction in the percentage of retail sales for brick and mortar, the overall sales volume growth remains up. There's some other big trends, I think, that are going to fuel the proliferation of e-commerce and advertising in the long term. It's important to note that when it comes to launching and starting new businesses, money is historically cheap meaning interest rates today are on a 5,000 year low. It has never been as cheap as today to borrow money. The ancient Egypts couldn't have done it at the rates that um, we can get money today. And indeed, on that basis, venture funding in Europe in particular is now hitting new highs. As you can see here, this massive spike in H1 2021. And a lot of that funding is actually going to businesses that are natively focusing on the digital economy, thus have e-commerce baked into their initial business plan and not as an add-on to a pre-existing brick and mortar business. Similarly, we can see that new business registrations here in the EU27 are surging. So we see in 2021, the fastest growth since 2016 when it comes to registrations of new businesses who again, are being small businesses, so not venture backed, um, but these businesses are also predominantly focusing on digital goods and services. Thus again, e-commerce baked into the DNA and not being a bolt on. And you can see similarly, if we look at some of the um, bigger digital endemics, like digitally native companies, that they are in fact are investing massively in marketing. And a lot of that is not just digital marketing, but also marketing related to e-commerce of driving the purchase of goods, physical goods in the digital world or digital goods and services in the digital world. Here's a selection of companies that have recently IPO'd put in Delivery Hero here as a, um, a European company, 2017 IPO for good measure. But the remarkable thing you can see here is that not only is revenue growth double or triple digit, but marketing growth tracks very closely or even exceeds this revenue growth. Meaning there's a lot of money flowing into the marketing sector that is digitally, for, for digitally native goods, which are often attached to e-commerce. And marketing is a key expenditure for these companies, actually an investment item. Um, if you look at this benchmark group that I've developed here, around 22% 
of their revenue goes on marketing, which is very closely behind traditional CPG firms, which are the kind of historical underwriters, if you will, of the advertising economy, those who supported the soap operas in the 60s and so forth. So this is a not only a sizable sector, but a sector for whom marketing is critical. But it's not just these digital endemics. Increasingly, we also see legacy consumer packaged good companies doubling down on e-commerce. Um, if we go into any quarterly results and analyst conference call, we can find e-commerce being mentioned front, right, and center. And indeed, here two very familiar companies, which we are heavily associating with the brick and mortar economy, with physical goods, Unilever and Procter & Gamble, who in Q3 2021 calendar year, you know that Procter & Gamble has a different financial year than a calendar year, make 12 to 14% of all sales based on e-commerce, often on third-party platforms. So there is an overall, that's the key message here, an overall economic shift to e-commerce, regardless of whether you are a digitally endemic company, whether you're large venture backed or small, small medium-sized businesses, or whether you are a legacy large Fortune 500 brand with roots in the physical economy. And indeed, with this in mind, we're expecting that e-commerce sales overall, this is just consumer e-commerce, so B2B is an entirely different market, but that B2C e-commerce um, revenue in Europe will be over 1 trillion now in 2021. This isn't advertising, but it is overall e-commerce sales. But advertising here is baked in. It's integral to the overall business model. I allude to that. Um, when I spoke about these different companies coming into that. But I think it really becomes clear if we look at how the cost structure looks like in e-commerce. Increasingly, e-commerce advertisers want to move from a funnel-based model, which we have conventionally in advertising, to a cylinder-based model, where they are more selective about whom they reach in the first place, but maintain the level of reach um, and, and addressability throughout the purchase journey. So to keep the cylinder narrow at the top, but as wide as possible, at the bottom to maximize conversion. This is really important because if we look at a typical e-commerce cost allocation waterfall, you've got your sales, you have contractual terms, either with your host brands, if you're a platform um, or with a platform, if you're a brand, you have your fulfillment, your delivery costs, and you've got your EBITDA. And in the middle is this obscure bucket called SGNA, Services General and Administration, of which marketing is a crucial component. And you can see that the percentages of this bucket vary considerably, meaning that marketing and advertising, the effectiveness of doing that in e-commerce is one of the biggest levers to overall e-commerce sales profitability because margins can be quite slim, meaning effective marketing is not just a cost, but it's a crucial investment that is baked into in an integral part of the business model. And it needs to be, in most cases, always on. And we can see the landscape changing. Agencies are now doubling down on e-commerce capabilities through strategic acquisitions as they realize this isn't just about media sales anymore. One needs to combine paid media with consulting, data onboarding, um, curating creators, and so forth. So key acquisitions just happened in the last couple of months um, for three holding companies, and we expect this trend to continue quite quickly. Um, overall, there are other new players coming in. Um, the influencer economy is increasingly moving towards a creator economy. This isn't just semantics, but influencers historically make money from advertising or paid content, whereas creators do more. They are more actively involved in the sales process, thus in commerce. So not through product placement or sponsoring or ads, but actively selling things, often also their own brands. And we can see across social platforms that, that create a landscape, professional or um, amateur landscape, profilerating very, very, very quickly. And indeed, we see venture capital being pumped into this as well um, across very, very different things. Creator services. So this is, for instance, um, analytics, creator agencies, and so forth. Platforms for um, matching creators and brands. Shopping, which means um, 
you know, integrated solutions so that um, creators can produce and distribute goods, for instance. Crypto, there's a whole overall in particular in the gaming commerce a space, um, entire crypto infra infrastructure around creators. Music is a key area, gaming is an area, uh, and then there are other verticals like education, for instance, and then, and then social media. But overall, we can see we are um, in an ecosystem building phase when it comes to creators who are attached to commerce. Why is this important? To really understand the potential, we must look at China. We have the tendency in the West to see what is happening in the US. But I believe when we want to look at the future of e-commerce and understand how we can seize the full potential, we must look eastwards. Here are two people that might not be familiar uh, to most of you. There's Via and there's Austin Lee. They are two of the big creators in China, working across platforms, working with Taobao and others, who are, as you can see here, actively selling goods from other brands. And indeed, just on Singles Day a couple of weeks ago, they generated 2.7 billion euros of sales in a 10 hour live streaming session compared to just a benchmark that's against Zalando's 2020 revenue of a billion in 365 days. So this is big business. And, in, and indeed, if we look at China, social commerce is an integral component of e-commerce with lots of headroom for growth. We can see the Chinese market is more than 10x the US, more than 12x Europe. And um, we as the West, we have catching up to do, but the market here is growing extremely quickly. Um, it's kind of a teleshopping 2.0 world where we see the native integration between exposure on platforms, think of um, an Instagram, think of a Snap and so forth, and the ability to purchase. Meaning consumers also require here that brand and performance, um, the exposure and the purchase are being compressed further. Um, maybe even in a single ad or then in a single um, live streaming session, which also is a, show, is a social event. And this really also speaks to the cylinder notion of advertising that I mentioned earlier. To, to make this work, it requires platforms, service providers, brands, retailers, and influencers to really collaborate. On the right, you can see our traditional teleshopping world. We can now see new startups like Live Buy working across different social platforms to make this happen. And just to show you on the left here the potential of this market in the West. So here we have social commerce, the share of social commerce across these three geographies here in the purple color and the deep blue color we have across these three the digital ad market share. And you can see just how much headroom of, for growth there is in the US and Europe for social commerce if you compare it to the size of the Chinese market. Overall in China now 50% of all retail sales are e-commerce, a historic landmark achieved in 2021, but other markets are behind. So we can see a considerable gap globally um, against China. So if we exclude South Korea, another leading Asian market, and we can see the next biggest uh, in terms of maturity is the UK, but it is nearly 24 percentage points behind China. The good news here, I think, for Europe is the following. If you look at these top 10 markets, including China, seven out of the remaining top nine are European. So there's a considerable potential for European markets to, in the West, take a leadership role when it comes to e-commerce and also the advertising opportunity attached to it. Um, although the US has, a, of course, bigger market size, just from a maturity perspective, um, Europe, some European markets are actually ahead of that. Beyond e-commerce um, or general e-commerce, let's be a bit more specific in the last remaining minute here. Everybody we know due to privacy changes and so forth wants to become an advertising company. Apple launched search ads, we saw retailers pushing into advertising and so forth to build their own walled garden or some call it content fortresses, which combine content, data and conversion into one single platform. And we see social platforms with social shopping going into that direction as well from walled garden more towards content fortress. Why is this attractive? We can see advertising has a bigger margin than bananas. Um, in-store e-commerce margins um, can be fairly thin. And even if they're rich and healthy, the ad margins are typically much higher. So we see retailers across the world, particularly now in Europe, heavily moving into this space to provide e-commerce platforms and offer ad inventory as well. We can see this is big business. 
Um, we expect this to turn into a nearly 30 billion euro market in 2026. And at IB Europe, we're not even fully capturing that yet in our aspect. And the great news here is I think it moves from the lower funnels of sponsored placements on, on websites to on-site display advertising, but then also off-site display where retailer data is being used on third-party platforms, for instance, social platforms to drive intelligence around social commerce and so forth. And we see advertisers of like, retailers like Douglas, for instance, the, perf uh, the, the perfume store in, in Europe already moving in that direction. The real impact here is a complete, I think, reordering of the ad market um, where buyers and sellers are being reconfigured. And I think it's a golden opportunity for the ad market. So overall, I think we're just in the first inning really of e-commerce. We're seeing lots of M&A, we're seeing the cards being mixed, but we see long-term growth fueled by consumption changes that the ad market can really capitalize on in many different ways. And with that, back to Mary Claire, thank you. Thank you, Daniel. That was yeah, very insightful. And I think building on that now, we're going to hand over to Zara for some um, more insights and kind of how, how brands can use this. So thank you, Zara, over to you. Thank you. Great. Um, excellent. Okay, so um, thanks so much, Daniel. Um, some really interesting um, economic trends there, and I really like the language of effective marketing as an investment, uh, not a cost. Um, so what I'm going to be talking about now is really trends that we've seen on our platform um, that are driving demonstrable growth um, and sort of explore how brands can really embrace these these trends and, and you know, very much aligned with, uh, with, with what Daniel's talked about. Um, so um, essentially, you know, we know we've seen this evolution in the touch points available to connect with audiences over the last 18 months. Um, you know, things like live, click to messenger that we've just seen in Daniel's presentation being crucial to uh, social commerce um, have really grown over the last 18 months in particular because of digital adoption and digital acceleration. Um, and, and as a result, becoming incredibly uh, powerful tools to connect with audiences to really collapse that panel, um, funnel even further. Um, what we wanted uh, and, and what we've seen from this expansion in touch points is a real um, shift in expectations um, of consumers for brands. So 82% now believe social media has heightened their expectations around brand interaction and 83% believe brands should use social channels to create a sense of community. So we've seen this expansion in touch points in, in terms of use, um, but actually what we see is now this is really shifting expectations. And what was important for us um, as we saw sort of really um, explore how brands were winning in this space, it was important for us to codify what success looked like and what was fueling success. So we developed um, our largest ever um, EMEA meta study into um, really unpacking what these trends were that were driving uh, significant growth for brands on our platform. We looked at 7,000 uh, studies across 54 countries, uh, 20 verticals. Um, and we found that ultimately the most successful brands uh, were building one of three multipliers into their campaigns. Um, and those three multipliers were connected voices, connected discovery and connected experiences. And I'll, I'll talk about these in more detail, uh, but ultimately these multipliers drove an increase of 139% shifts in deeper brand metrics. So consideration, association, um, incredibly challenging brand metrics to shift. Um, connected, connected discovery is ensuring that when you connect with a brand, you're able to shop it. So really collapsing that funnel. And what was interesting is, you know, we've seen that drives demonstrable success when it comes to performance and sales, but it's also, you know, one of those top three multipliers when it comes to brand as well and shifting brand metrics. Um, we then saw the next multiplier as connected experiences. So ensuring that we're using this expansion in, in touch points and the more innovative touch points available to us and more immersive touch points available to us. 
And then the third was connected voices, really using creators to connect the audience and brand. And it was these uh, one of these three multipliers that contributes to the 139% shift in deeper brand metrics. Um, so starting with connected discovery, um, what's you know what's important is that people come to our platform to dis to be discovered um, and and to inspire or to discover and be inspired, um, and they don't necessarily come to the platform to shop in the traditional sense, um, but they simply happen across products um, and 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 brands naturally as part of their journey. And what we find is the discovery mindset people are in really is um, provoking a sense of shopping spontaneity. Um, and it's moving from, you know, planned shopping occasions to just always being in that mindset where you're open to trying new things, you're open to discovering new brands, um, and it's driving spontaneity. So we see almost twice as many purchases um, for brands, you know, across multiple categories um, are spontaneous versus planned. Um, and as a result, in order to ensure that we are um, optimizing opportunities for brands, it's important we remove friction at all costs, we ensure that we have shoppable formats, and ultimately we ensure that you can be considered and purchased within a very small moment. So when you're open to trying new things, you have the opportunity to purchase. Um, and the thing that's most fascinating with this is you could look at this and think, okay, it's quite functional, but actually it's about the injection of creativity within all of this that makes this sort of multiplier very powerful and particularly powerful at shifting those deeper brand metrics. Uh, so removing friction, make it shoppable, but really inject creativity. And you can inject creativity through, through these two other touch points, um, which are the connected experiences and connected voices. So, so going on to connected experiences in a little bit more detail, this is really about leveraging the expansion and touch points from live, which is growing by 200%, uh, to click to messenger to tow AR, um, these more immersive formats. Um, and what we find is the reason why these touch points are becoming more and more credible when it comes to brand building is the scale. So now more than a billion people are using AR experiences powered by Spark AR with 700 million using AR each month across Facebook and Instagram. Um, and so where these touch points were, I think, are nice to have, they're now, because of their scale, becoming much more fundamental um, to incorporating them within campaigns. Um, I think a brilliant example of just, you know, bringing this to life is the work by made.com um, where by using spark ar you were able to reimagine um, a made product within your living room or, or, or the setting you wanted to see it in um, and the impact of that on brand and performance is, is particularly interesting so we saw a 60 percent higher consideration rate compared to retail norms uh, from this campaign we saw three times out of cart rate compared to when products weren't uh, viewed in ar we saw higher conversion rates and at 2.5 times conversion rates and over 90 percent of web sessions uh, were new users. So really broadening out this experience. And I think that's an important point as well. I think often we think that audiences that are more likely to interact with these experiences are ones that are closer to your brand, but actually we're finding they connect with new audiences. And we know that's key to building brands light and new users. Um, we also see that it's really driving and fueling discovery and purchase. We saw it play out, of course, in beauty. We see that when people interact with AR, it trebles their impact on sales. Um, and the case study on the left is from the music industry in entertainment, um, where you could hover um, on, on the product um, and essentially have a sound streaming through it as well. So really fascinating ways to, again, fuel a sense of creativity, but allow you to move from from discovery to purchase within a very, very small moment. Moving on to the next slide. Um, you can even stretch this even further. Um, and, and what we're seeing, which I think is particularly innovative, is how you can use AR to create digital goods or services to complement your brand. So Farfetch, you know, recently just became one of the first large retailers to test dig digital sampling by digitally dressed creators uh, to promote uh, the launch of its new pre-order offering. Um, I think this is really interesting when it comes to sustainability, when it comes to sampling, when it comes to shipping, um, really fascinating space to, to operate in and really showing the stretch 
of where you can go when it comes to these more immersive touch points. Um, and then the third multiplier that we saw play out um, in terms of being the you know, key contributor to shifting deeper brand metrics was connected voices. And this is the impact of creators. Um, and we saw that really come through in, in, in Daniel's presentation, but really ensuring that you're representing communities effectively um, through creators um, is, is key. Um, you only need to look at, gosh, the growth of it is, is, is huge. You know, 121 billion minutes spent with thousands of creative content in 2020. 63% of 18 to 34 year olds trust what an influencer says about a brand more than traditional advertising. Two billion in venture capital has been invested since October 2020. It's huge. It's growing. Um, and it's hugely impactful because we trust creators. We trust, uh, we trust creators. They're powerful um, in connecting us um, with communities, with products, um, and, and this really came through in our research. Before I go into that research in a bit more detail, I think it's interesting just to look at Black Friday, actually, and compare that across a few years. So this is a tool we have called CrowdTangle, which essentially analyzes the levels of engagement around different topics. And you can see here, this is based on Black Friday related Instagram branded content posts uh, for 2018, 19, 20, and, and, and 21. And of course, we're just collecting the most recent data, but you can see that sort of red kind of line for 2021 just the growth of that over the last year versus other years is huge much earlier um so so i think this really highlights the impact that creators are having when it comes to commerce um and and funny enough picking up on, on on daniel's point i think when you have creator commerce and you align it with live and these live shopping experiences we're seeing um is hugely impactful um and actually looking at china as well who are really accelerating in this we saw chinese online pitch man sell 1.9 billion dollars worth of merchandising um, in a single day um, by um, Lipstick Brother is, is his name, but that's huge. Um, and so just so much potential and opportunity within this space, correcting, connecting creators to their audiences and using these touch points like live shopping to really, really fuel that further. Um, what, what came out of our research really clearly was um, the top two reasons for following a creator was authenticity and trust, um, and creative marketing outperforms traditional advertising by 2x. I think it's interesting. I think it's, it also highlights a shift in the types of creators we're looking to follow. I think, you know, we've moved on from, you know, just, you know, um, sort of superficial creators that authenticity and trust, I think, is really interesting. Um, and we also found from our research here that there is a clear uh, link between influential creators and diversity. Um, so we found that 30% feel a brand that works with diverse creators understands them. 32% of consumers feel more connected with brands that are working with a diverse set of creators. And 34% they discover more new brands of result, um, of, as a result of seeing content posted by creators with a more diverse background. So I think this alignment with diversity is particularly important um, to represent communities more effectively. Um, and I think when we look at advertising as a whole, and for the UK in particular, we see from Global Web Index that only 7% of people feel represented in the advertising they see. Um, so creators are an important way to uh, reflect communities effectively. And it works both ways. You know, creators also, 60% of creators want the brands they work with to allow them to incorporate DNI themes within their content. And 80% of creators want to work with brands who are actively and publicly supporting diversity and inclusion. And I think there's, you know, of course, a host of great work, but, you know, linking back to our to our earlier point on an expansion of touch points in AR, there's some really interesting opportunities that we can we can lean into uh, where we partner with creators with this expansion of in, in touch points to really magnify that impact that we've seen come through um, our research so effectively. Um, and I think a really important point we should always bear in mind when thinking about how we plan for creators is, you know, are you in control enough to let go, leave it to your, you know, have a clear, you know, brand identity and a clear point of view, but leave it to your creators to share that and represent uh, that in the most authentic way they can. Um, what was 
you know, also interesting about the research we found on uh, connected brands, not only did they drive that 139% increase um, in effectiveness by incorporating one of those three multipliers, but they were also very efficient and they're an efficient way of using um, our platform too. So um, we saw that they received a 33% higher ads um, quality score, which is essentially the score you get in the auction. And if you have a higher ad quality score, you actually pay less. So they're more efficient. They require low levels, lower levels of frequency because they're impactful in their own right. So you don't need to work as hard to drive that creativity. They're create, it's creative by its nature. Um, and again, as, as mentioned before, they were more effective when communicating with a broader audience, which I think is a really important point here. Um, they, they allow you to, to, to go broader and reach new and light users um, and, and in that way, widen the net. So, you know, in summary, um, we've looked to codify what success looks like on our platform, especially in light of this expansion in touch points um, and, and observing what is working particularly well with uh, successful brands. Um, and it's about using one of these three multipliers, connected discovery, ensuring that you know, there is a shoppable layer and really collapsing that funnel and that cylinder shape that you know, Daniel talked about earlier. Uh, but don't think that's about removing creativity. It's absolutely about injecting creativity. And you do that through using the expansion and touch points available within connected experiences and really using creators. Um, they drive brand, they drive sales. I think some of those numbers that we've seen in this presentation and the early uh, um, and Daniel's earlier is, is just, you know, demonstrable impact on sales. Um, and so, you know, everything to, to play for. And I think a really interesting, um, interesting time for possibilities and opportunities within this space. So I'll stop sharing and um, I think we will um, get into some questions. Exactly. Uh, thanks, Zara. That was a, a fascinating view inside the engine room of what mm -hmm. you at Meta are doing within these broader trends of e-commerce. And I think you highlighted very well that e-commerce and social commerce are often intertwined. It's not an add-on, but that for many brands, it's really, it's really baked in. And you spoke about these three success factors, which are crucial, which you identified um, yeah, in terms of connected brands. Um, which of those do you think is um, most exciting? That's a great question. Um, I, think they, I think they all are. And I, I actually think the most exciting part is how they can work together. So the research, you know, we deliberately, it was deliberately separated for good reason. Mm. But actually, I think some of the best work is, you know, using, using, I think as a fundamental, you need to make sure that everything can be shoppable to the point we're talking about with social commerce and, and how people are now expecting to consume things. Um, and that's really connected discovery, you know, make sure you can be discovered and purchased within a very small moment. Mm. Uh, but on top of that, I think, make sure you're using creators to really drive that impact or using that expansion and touch points, you know, so live, for example, you know, the fact that it's grown by such a significant percentage in our market. And then you combine that with creators and you're getting into this QVC-esque 2.0 way of shopping, you know, that's fascinating. Or AR, um, you know, one of the case studies I think that's really interesting is Sephora, um, we're launching a fragrance during the pandemic. Uh, obviously, you couldn't, you know, that's almost impossible without being able to smell and use scent. Um, but they worked with creators and AR filters to find ways of recreating what that scent could be. Um, they actually worked with a creator who is an expert within neuroscience. And they found that the receptors associated with smell are the same to do with taste. So they created filters all around taste to gauge that sense of smell. So I just think that, you know, I, I suppose the number one thing here that unifies everything is creativity. Creativity at every single touch point to really connect with your audience. And these are some really fascinating touch points that can enable you to do this. We come coming into uh, creators and AR in a, in a second. I think for many brands that are new to this, and we've seen some fascinating case studies, it's hmm, how do I move from, PowerPoint to application. Um, so what's your advice? How can how can brands get started uh, in this in this new world? 
Yeah, I mean, I, th I think it's test, you know, test and learn, experiment. It doesn't have to be a huge investment. Um, I think, you know, test how different things could work for you. Um, you know, there's there's several different ways of working with creators. There's, you know, great tools like the CrowdTangle tool I shared, which you can have access to, which just allows you to see what creators are engaging with, what type of content, what brands they're working with, just to get a sense. You know, I think you can you can gauge a sense of what, what you could start to experiment with. But I would just encourage uh, test and learn here um, and, 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 and see what works. Um, and then go from there. But I think I think that's just gets, you know, the most important thing is to get started with this. Um, so, so yeah, you know, I think it's only the first step here. I think there's so much potential and opportunity that we haven't even talked about in this session. Um, but let's start here. Um, and I think that that's really interesting. And you mentioned some brands and a maid, you mentioned Sephora. Um, do brands come to social commerce typically with a clear, mature plan? Or do they need guidance? And then how does this notion of exper experimentation fit in there? I think it, I mean, I think it depends. I think ultimately it has to start with what your brand objective is. What's your brand outcome? We know that's the most important thing. What are you looking to shift as a brand? Where, you know, is it awareness, preference? You know, what, be really laser focused around what brand outcome you're looking to shift. Um, you know, we recently did a, a Oxford did a, a, you know, one of the largest ever academic studies with Kantar. Um, and one of the most important findings from that was when it comes to brand building, be really clear about your brand outcome because there isn't a one size fits all. Um, and it's about using different recipes that work best for that brand outcome. So come with a clear brand outcome. And then I think work with partners to really support how we can navigate through this creator economy um, to get you started. Um, because there's there's some great work out there to, to be had. So yeah, I, I think I think it's really interesting. I mean, what do you what what do you think, Daniel, in terms of um, you know, what needs to to happen to unlock more opportunities within this space and within social commerce. In, in I think, you know, yeah, I think we've seen how big the potential is when we when we, when we look at China, and I think that's really it's it's really a market where uh, China is kind of ahead of the game. Um, I think, it, yeah, there needs to be more awareness for brands, but then the ability to move more than experimental budget. So there needs to be measurement and control. Um, I think the creator landscape, as we see, is kind of messy. We got lots of different creators and um, um, brands need a better compass to figure out what creators to work with, right? We don't assess, you know, we have the big brand creators and I showed some of those in my presentation, but increasingly we also have um, micro creators, which are very good for one vertical or one, or, or one brand. But how do you as a band pick that? What are your KPIs? What are your vetting mechanisms? And how can you... Um, build trust is it really do you need to engage with the creator personally or do you uh, kind of do it like um, you know booking a holiday do you use a self-serve platform and so forth it's uh, um, I think the the value chain needs to needs to smoothen a lot uh, to unlock to unlock additional budgets yeah I, I, I completely agree with you and I your point around I think measurement's key here because I think we need to see what's working within this space for brands, um, depending on what their brand objective is, depending on what the challenges that they need to bridge when it comes to yeah. creators. Because there are, because you could get lost. There are so many, so many ways you can go. I know we're running out of time, and I'm really, I'm really keen to, um, you know, explore. Um, perhaps as one last question, um, based on on what you talked about, uh, Daniel, who who do you think will win when it comes to retail media? Um, I think um, right now it's um, it's a pioneer market. Um, everybody is um, running, rushing towards this gold rush. But um, clearly who will win is um, those who um, provide the pickaxes and the tools for sure, because um, it requires new infrastructure, new measurement, et cetera. When it comes to retailers as such, um, I think, We've seen digital time and again that um, either it's a winner-take-all market or we see massive concentration and consolidation. I think um, for retailers, we'll see by market one or two category leaders. So one or two who thrive in beauty, 
Um, maybe when it comes to supermarkets, um, it's going to be a bit more because there we already have differentiated brands that consumers are familiar with. But typically, we're going to see um, yeah, a rush to be the leader in the market and then concentration so that um, more things can be serviced um, of one platform. Because in the end, analytics, recommendations, that stuff is going to get really expensive and really tricky. And we have to see when it comes to retailers, again, the, the example from supermarkets, I spoke with, uh, yeah. with Ron recently, who really highlighted the culture clash within the organizations. If you are a, a retailer, your C-level management hasn't really cared or thought about becoming a publisher or having agency-like capabilities. So the retail media units are often fairly disconnected and have to do lots of convincing to the CFO, to the CEO about what they're doing. Luckily, that's changing because, you know, as usual, typically when money comes in, um, eyes widen and um, questions become more positive. But it's a massive cultural shift that needs to happen. And I don't think everybody will be able to do that. And some will fare better with outsourcing that to, some, to, uh, to somewhere else. I, I agree. This is a huge cultural shift, a huge shift in skill sets um, as well that, 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 need, that needs to take mm. place too. Brilliant. Well, I think we're at time, um, but great, uh, great as always, Daniel, to, to, to connect on this Likewise. and to explore further. Thank you very much to both of you. It's been um, very, very insightful. And I think um, so, so much exciting stuff to come in, in e-commerce and retail media next year that um, I'm sure we'll be we'll be chatting about this more. Um, and it's I know for us that IAB Europe e-commerce is, is definitely um, on our agenda for, for 2022. So more to come. So, yeah, thank you very much to everyone that participated um, in today's session. Um, as mentioned, it has been recorded. So we'll be sharing this with with all of you um, and it will be popped up on our website as well. So thank you again for joining us and enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>